a global stage for diplomacy, a platform for international politics, a barometer of world affairs. The peoples of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. 1945, the world was screaming out its revulsion to the Second World War, and the United Nations was born of a collective hope for lasting peace. Its mission, to prevent war, uphold international law, fight for human rights, and promote social and economic progress. Tested by divisions, conflicts, and crises, 75 years on, is the United Nations fulfilling its mission? How did it get here, and where does its future lie? As the UN turns 75 in 2020, this documentary takes you through the times and tides of this mighty organization and looks into its future. An invisible killer is sweeping the world as 2020 kickstarts. In a matter of weeks, COVID-19 has changed life as we know it. Worldwide, tens of millions are infected and the death toll continues to rise. And now, borders closed, schools shut down, cities on lockdown, and the global economy is at risk of the biggest downturn since the Great Depression. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. The World Health Organization, within the framework of the United Nations, has been spearheading the international response in the fight against COVID-19. But for some, the WHO has become the focus of fury. They have to do a better job. They have to be much more fair to other countries, including the United States, or we're not going to be involved with them anymore. We'll do it a separate way. The capacity of the United Nations is once again being put to the test. But when globalization is at a crossroads, where does the UN go from here? Which twice in our lifetime have brought untold sorrow to mankind. In 1849, it all begins it with the story the of San Francisco. Caused in torment from the two world wars, Allied in power, fresh from a costly victory, decided no the world cannot afford another war. It came together to design machinery to keep peace. And I think there was a very strong desire now after having two world wars, and two wars which in particular really destroyed Europe and the European great powers and the colonial system, all of that went out, went out the window. Uh, but I think there was a stronger desire amongst the citizens who were over, around the world who had experienced so much trauma from war uh, to put more effort into a multilateral organization that could help uh, to not only gener maintain peace but to promote economic growth, uh, uh, protect human rights, etc. No diplomatic gathering in history had ever captured the hopes of all the world as did the United Nations Conference on International Organization when it opened on April 25, 1945. Representatives of 50 countries assembled in San Francisco, the United States, representing almost 2 billion people at the time, more than 80% of humanity. They agreed on a procedure, set up a committee, and started to write the charter. For nine weeks in the spring of 1945, San Francisco was the center of people's hopes for lasting peace. A general assembly was made, in which all the United Nations member countries would have an equal vote. A security council was created to keep the peace, with permanent seats for the United States, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, France and China. Its power was based on the rule of unanimity of the Permanent Five. A trusteeship council was established to help certain colonies to independence, and an economic and social council also came into shape. 
the office of Secretary General was formed and the duties of the Secretariat were set. Then, the delegates signed the charter they had written. On October 24, 1945, the United Nations as we know it today began its official existence. The UN Charter became a treaty, legally binding on the nations that signed it. It began with these words. We, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. China, one of the founding members of the United Nations, was the first to sign the Charter. In 1971, the United Nations recognized the People's Republic of China as the only legitimate representative of China to the United Nations. I believe that the restoration of the PRC's seat at the UN in 1971 was important to China, to the world, and to the UN itself. This move expanded the UN's reach, made it more representative, and lent it greater authority. The United Nations initially had just 51 member states. Today, the organization, which is headquartered in New York City, has 193 members. Over the past 75 years, the UN has taken on new roles and tasks, but the fundamental issues the UN focuses on remain the same. To promote international peace and security, social and economic development, and human rights for all nations. Since its founding, the United Nations has become a center stage for diplomacy and international politics. At its numerous open and closed door meetings, diplomats fight for their interests while trying to reach consensus. Any agreement reached would require intensive behind-the-scenes diplomacy. A global stage for diplomacy. A platform for international politics. A barometer of world affairs. The peoples of the United Nations determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. 1945. The world was screaming out its revulsion to the Second World War, and the United Nations was born of a collective hope for lasting peace. Its mission, to prevent war, uphold international law, fight for human rights, and promote social and economic progress. Tested by divisions, conflicts, and crises, 75 years on, is the United Nations fulfilling its mission? How did it get here? and where does its future lie? As the UN turns 75 in 2020, this documentary takes you through the times and tides of this mighty organization and looks into its future. In the aftermath of the Second World War, most of the world soon split into two camps, either under U.S. or Soviet influence as the Cold War took hold. The United Nations quickly became a Cold War battleground between the two superpowers. Since both the United States and the Soviet Union held vetoes and a joint permission from the two was nearly impossible, the Security Council often found itself in a stalemate. The UN Security Council, the five permanent members, you know, each having a, a veto, in the Cold War it made uh, a lot of actions but potentially the UN could have done impossible because either the United States or the Soviet Union um, had the power to veto it and they were, their, their conflict in the Cold War was, was pretty much uh, um, zero-sum. Uh, there, someone else's gain was someone else's loss. So it was definitely a, a major constraint on the organization in dealing with, with many conflicts. Although the Cold War limited the United Nations' ability to function effectively, the organization did play a role in keeping the Cold War from becoming a hot war along with other factors. I think that we must recognize that this period of 75 years is probably the only period in the history of humankind 
where the big powers had not wars among them. We have many conflicts around the world, but not a conflict like the Second World War or the First World War or the Napoleonic Wars or others that we had in the past in which the big powers were fighting each other. One of the main areas of UN success during the Cold War era was decolonization, which was supported by both superpowers. Since the establishment of the United Nations, 80 former colonies have gained independence. Immense progress was also made on the codification and further development of international law. And by simply providing a peaceful platform for global discussions, improvements towards cooperation among member countries were made possible. To secure the hard-earned peace after the war, the UN has been active in promoting arms control and disarmament since its inception. The very first resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations in January 1946 addressed the problems raised by the discovery of atomic energy. Over the years, the UN has facilitated the negotiation of several multilateral arms control treaties, including the 1968 Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the 1972 Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention, the 1993 Chemical Weapons Convention, the 1996 Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, the Arms Trade Treaty in 2013, and many more. Among all countries, China is the first nuclear weapons state to adopt a nuclear no-first-use policy and an official pledge not to use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapons states. It has also pledged to halt exports of nuclear technology to unsafeguarded facilities. On top of that, China has been consistently advocating complete prohibition and thorough destruction of nuclear weapons. By the end of the 1970s, Iran and Iraq had eyed each other warily and soon came to blows in what was known as the Iran-Iraq War. Already grappling with the challenges of the Cold War, the UN was faced with another test brought by the Iran-Iraq War from 1980 to 1988. The UN helps uphold fairness and justice on the international stage. However, if the countries, people and other parties involved ignore it, then it cannot play that role effectively. That's why the UN did its utmost in the Iran-Iraq war, issuing several resolutions. On July 20, 1987, after extensive consultations, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 598, calling for an immediate ceasefire. It took one year before both parties accepted Resolution 598. Saddam accepted it immediately, but Iran refused. They wanted much stricter terms for the ceasefire than the Security Council. They wanted Saddam punished as a war criminal, a mention of who was on the side of justice and so on. But one year later, they were worn out. The day after Saddam's counterattack, they accepted the resolution. Ayatollah Khomeini said that accepting Resolution 598 was worse than drinking poison, but he had to do it. The UN provided both sides, Iran and Iraq, with a letter to go climb down from the high tree they both said. In August 1988, after almost eight years of war and following a period of intensive negotiations between the UN Secretary General and the two foreign ministers, the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Republic of Iraq agreed to a suggestion of then-Secretary-General Javier Pérez de Cuillar, which combined the establishment of a ceasefire and the beginning of direct talks between the two foreign ministers under the auspices of the Secretary-General. The eight-year-long conflict had finally come to an end. The Iran-Iraq war has become a testament 
to one of the most successful stories of the UN in mediating a major regional conflict. In 1990, the United Nations was confronted with yet another armed clash, this time between Saddam Hussein's Iraq and its neighbor Kuwait, in what would become known as the Gulf War. On August 2, 1990, Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein ordered the invasion of Kuwait over a number of contentious issues, including oil disputes. The United Nations responded quickly. On the same day, it adopted Resolution 660, condemning Iraq for aggression. The UN played its role well in the Gulf War. This was the most comprehensive, most thorough, most outstanding, most just, and most appropriate way it has ever played its role. In a matter of months, the Security Council passed a dozen strong resolutions against Saddam Hussein's violation of the peace. They included an ultimatum to Iraq to either withdraw its troops or face an overwhelming multinational military force authorized by the United Nations As for the Security Council, the political standing and regulating ability of the UN meet the expectations of nearly every country in the world. Saddam had broken every norm of international relations. He had angered everyone. There was no room left for negotiation. On January 16, 1991, the offensive against the Iraqi army began fought by a broad coalition of armed forces, including the United States, the UK, France, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, among many others. In just 43 days, the war was over. After years of Cold War paralysis, it seemed the Security Council could now act decisively. Shortly after the Gulf War, the Soviet Union dissolved into its component republics in late 1991. After 45 years, the Cold War had come to an end. Russia took the Soviet Union seat at the UN Security Council. The rivalry between the Soviet and American blocs was replaced by greater cooperation among the permanent five members of the Security Council marking a golden decade in the 1990s. The UN saw a radical expansion of its peacekeeping duties, taking on more missions in 10 years than it had in the previous four decades. The number of adopted Security Council resolutions and the peacekeeping budget both increased significantly. Over the years, peacekeeping has become the UN's primary function in the domain of peace and security. The first UN peacekeeping mission was established on May 29, 1948, when the Security Council authorized the deployment of a small number of UN military observers to the Middle East to form the United Nations Truce Supervision Organization to monitor the arms disagreement between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Since then, more than one million men and women have served in 71 UN peacekeeping operations, directly impacting the lives of millions of people. The blue helmet has become a powerful symbol of the UN in peacekeeping and is synonymous with security to many people in conflict regions. The UN and its peacekeeping operations have played a pivotal role in de-escalating regional conflicts preventing the occurrence of a third world war, protecting human rights, protecting civilians, and promoting social and economic development in the host countries and the regions. Today, UN peacekeeping deploys more than 95,000 military, police, and civilian personnel in 13 operations. As of 2020, more than 3,900 peacekeepers have lost their lives serving the cause of peace. Since joining global peacekeeping missions in 1990, the Chinese military's involvement in peacekeeping has grown dramatically. 
from Democratic Republic of the Congo to Mali to Darfur, Sudan, and beyond. China has provided more peacekeeping troops than any other permanent members of the UN Security Council. China is also the second largest contributor to the UN peacekeeping budget. The international community should regard the world as a community of shared destiny, pool their efforts, and forge a strong partnership to cope with the challenges together. And I think the key is to support the UN, to support the authoritative role of the UN in order for it to play a bigger part in maintaining peace and security. Apart from wars, humanity is constantly under the threat of hunger, poverty, and many other challenges. Development has always been a priority for the United Nations. In September 2000, Leaders of 189 countries gathered at the UN headquarters and signed the historic Millennium Declaration, in which they committed to achieving a set of eight measurable goals that range from having extreme poverty and hunger to promoting gender equality and reducing child mortality by 2015. For 15 years, the Millennium Development Goals drove progress in several key areas. By 2015, more than one billion people had been lifted out of extreme poverty. Child mortality dropped by more than half compared with 1990. The number of out-of-school children has dropped by more than half since 1990 as well. And HIV-AIDS infections fell by almost 40 percent since 2000. China had helped over 700 million people escape poverty over the past 40 years accounting for 70% of the population lifted out of poverty worldwide. Beijing is also determined to eradicate extreme poverty nationwide by the end of 2020 and achieve the relevant target of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development 10 years ahead of time. In 2015, the 70th session of the UN General Assembly adopted resolution for transforming our world the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, chartering the direction for the development of all countries and global development cooperation. It rolled out a global development agenda spanning from 2015 to 2030, calling the world to shift onto a more sustainable path. If all the 17 goals are achieved, then we will have a world free of poverty, hunger, disease, and want, a world free of fear and violence, a world with universal literacy, with equitable and universal access to quality education. As the world develops and its population grows, human impact on climate is becoming more evident as global warming is increasingly taking its toll. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change entered into force on March 21, 1994. Today, it has 197 contracting parties, including 196 countries and one regional economic integration organization on board. Together with the Convention, the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Accord established the institutional agreements of intergovernmental cooperation on curbing climate change. China has always been a dedicated supporter of the Paris Accord. We exceeded all our commitments for the end of 2020 one year ahead of schedule. In the 14 five-year plan, we'll lay the groundwork for meeting or exceeding our intended nationally determined contributions for 2030. The fact that China is able to be a participant, creator, and contributor in multiple competition is inseparable from our policy measures and actions. The United Nations is said to be the only forum in which an agreement aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions can realistically be brokered among the 190-plus countries with different outlooks and economies, but of a common atmosphere. Over the years, the organization has played a pivotal role in building the scientific consensus, 
raising climate change issues to the front pages of the world's media and putting it in the in-tray of the heads of state and government, as well as the chief executive officers of businesses and industries. The United Nations, since its inception, has been actively involved in promoting and protecting health worldwide. Leading that effort within the UN system is the World Health Organization, whose constitution came into force on April 7, 1948. Since its creation, the WHO has contributed to many historic achievements in global public health, including eradicating smallpox, reducing polio cases worldwide by 99%, curbing the Ebola virus outbreak in West Africa in 2014. Today, the WHO is leading the global effort against the COVID-19 pandemic. Moreover, the UN has also been driving collaboration among nations through education, science, and culture. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization was born on November 4, 1946. Today, UNESCO has 193 members, and its mission is building peace in the minds of men and women. It seeks to build peace through international cooperation in education, science, and culture. Thousands of Americans took to the streets to protest racism across the country after George Floyd, an African American, was killed by a police officer who kept his knee on Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes, even as Floyd repeatedly said, I can't breathe, it, it and hurt. eventually became unresponsive. Everybody the incident was clearly reported on world. video. I can't breathe. Oh, ah. Shut up. The protests soon spread to other parts of the world, from London to Pretoria to Sydney and beyond. On June 17, 2020, weeks after the death of George Floyd, the United Nations Human Rights Council held an urgent debate at the UN headquarters in Geneva on police brutality and systemic racism in the United States. The 47-member state forum unanimously adopted a resolution brought by African countries strongly condemning the discriminatory and violent policing which led to the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis and requested a report on systemic racism against people of African descent especially those incidents Change that resulted in the years. death of George Floyd. The mandate also through. asks UN well High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, to, to examine government to responses to peaceful protests, policy. including alleged use of excessive force. I think the, the UN is doing what it possibly can within a political environment. There will always be criticism. When I saw uh, the criticism of the US on the Human Rights Council, that they claimed that Israel was, was treating, treated badly, and I, of course, also didn't like some of the comments made on Israel within the Human Rights Council, but it also says something about being a sore loser. I mean, if you can't win your political argument and you start to claim that the institution is not working, I think the UN can stand that uh, and it can, can thrive without uh, subsuming to that kind of criticism. It's a political body, politics always plays a role and that will be the case. Uh, so not to worry, uh, just continue the good work the UN is doing. One of the great achievements of the United Nations is the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 and the two international covenants that followed suit, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Very much like a concept launched by uh, President Xi Jinping, building a community, community of shared future for mankind, which accepts, which is based on the Chinese notion of harmony. And harmony in China means difference. So you work from difference, you respect differences, which is also the, the message of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but also it, it entails ownership because the president has made clear that he wants more impact from the global south in the, the international arena. Uh, this is what we're also, also doing, of course, in the area of human rights. 
Over the years, the United Nations has gradually expanded human rights law to encompass specific standards for women, children, persons with disabilities, minorities, and other vulnerable groups. In 1995, 17,600 participants from 197 countries and regions attended the Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing. For two weeks, government representatives worked on producing a document of agreed targets towards achieving gender equality, giving birth to the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, which is a milestone in advancing gender equality and the protection of women's rights. 25 years after the adoption of the Beijing Declaration, more women and girls now have access to free and quality education. Awareness and action against gender-based violence is improving, and there's been a gradual increase in women in positions of power and decision-making. 75 years since its founding, the United Nations has also coordinated numerous humanitarian relief operations in response to natural and man-made disasters, helping refugees and children, feeding the hungry and healing the sick. The UN has a fantastic role in humanitarian aid. Half of the international humanitarian aid is channeled through the UN agencies. I was in UNHCR, the High Commission for Refugees, but I see UNICEF, World Food Programme. I mean, the work these people do, sometimes in the most dangerous areas of the world, in the most dramatic situations, to rescue lives and to help people survive, and at the same time to protect people in dramatic situations, is something we can be very proud of. As a former Secretary General of the United Nations, even after three years and eight months of my retirement, I still believe that the United Nations provides and gives the best hope for humanity in realizing their dreams for a better world, better future. A global stage for diplomacy, a platform for international politics, a barometer of world affairs. The peoples of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. 1945. The world was screaming out its revulsion to the Second World War, and the United Nations was born of a collective hope for lasting peace. Its mission, to prevent war, uphold international law, fight for human rights, and promote social and economic progress. Tested by divisions, conflicts, and crises, 75 years on, is the United Nations fulfilling its mission? How did it get here, and where does its future lie? As the UN turns 75 in 2020, this documentary takes you through the times and tides of this mighty organization and looks into its future. Despite its achievements, the United Nations is not without controversies. In its 75 years of history, the organization has faced numerous challenges. The worst setback in the recent history of the UN is said to be the Anglo-American invasion of Iraq in March 2003. Two years before the Iraq War, on September 11, 2001, 19 militants associated with the Islamic extremist group Al-Qaeda hijacked four airplanes and carried out suicide attacks against targets in the United States. Almost 3,000 people were killed in the 9-11 attacks. America took revenge quickly, launching the Afghanistan war in the same year, with the goal of ousting the Taliban from Afghanistan and dismantling Al-Qaeda. Soon after that, the Bush administration had labeled Iraq a country of the axis of evil and sought to link Saddam Hussein to Al-Qaeda while mulling military strikes against Iraq. It then accused Iraq of possessing weapons of mass destruction an accusation that was later proved untrue. In the lead-up to open warfare, the Iraq situation had caused major disagreements among the Permanent Five at the Security Council, with Russia, 
France and China objecting to the build-up to war, and Britain and the U.S. strongly supporting military actions. However, on March 17, 2003, seeking no further UN resolutions and deeming further diplomatic efforts by the Security Council futile, then U.S. President George W. Bush abruptly declared an end to diplomacy. Must leave Iraq within 48 hours. Their refusal to do so will result in military conflict, commenced at a time of our choosing. And issued an ultimatum to Saddam Hussein, giving the Iraqi president 48 hours to leave Iraq. And when Saddam Hussein refused to leave Iraq, U.S. and Allied forces launched an attack on the morning of March 20th without the consent of the United Nations. Most, the vast majority, of international lawyers, experts on international law, say definitely it was a violation of the UN Charter. Definitely, President Bush violated, without any question, the, uh, the authority or the uh, charter of the United Nations. Years later, the Iraq War has left the Middle Eastern country in ruins and in turn created a power vacuum that gave rise to ISIS's initial success in Iraq and Syria. And the threat of America's unilateral actions did not end there. Since 2017, the U.S. has withdrawn from the Paris Climate Accord, the Iran nuclear deal, the U.N. Human Rights Council, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, and UNESCO. It is also officially moving to withdrawal from the World Health Organization amid the coronavirus pandemic. America's unilateralism has dealt a serious blow to the multilateral world order under the UN framework. I cannot but express my deepest concern the United Nations and multilateralism as a whole is in disarray. This multilateralism is undercut by those countries who have really initiated and who have been leading, leading this world without their full solidarity and united actions, United Nations will not be able to um, carry on, on their, on their uh, missions. It's dubbed the darkest chapter in the history of the UN. In just 100 days in 1994, about 800,000 people were slaughtered in Rwanda. The scale and speed of the slaughter shocked the world, and the United Nations was harshly criticized in the wake of the massacre for not intervening. A year after U.S. troops were killed in Somalia, the U.S. was determined not to get involved in another African conflict. The U.N. and Belgium had forces in Rwanda but most of them pulled out after 10 Belgian soldiers were killed. And at that time, when America was the, uni was the sole power, the policeman of the world, how the UN behaved very much depended on what the Americans thought. Mm -hmm. and, and they had decided that they are not going to intervene in Africa or in any other situation in genocide. The simple explanation goes back to Somalia. The Americans had faced one of the worst, uh, you know, experience in Africa. And a, a number of American soldiers were killed in that country, forcing the, the UN to withdraw its peacekeeping force in Somalia. A 1999 UN report assessing the Rwanda deployment called the mission disgraceful for abandoning Tutsi refugees in schools and other supposed safe zones they had created. When commemorating the Rwanda genocide on April 7, 2020, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres urged the world to reject hate speech and forces of polarization. The Rwandese genocide has had uh, impact on how uh, countries intervene in others. And that if that has to happen, it has to be within an agreed framework, which is multilateral. Over the years, UN reform has been endlessly discussed. 
but there's been sharp disagreements on what kind of reform is needed and for what purpose. In many cases, UN reform is not a politically neutral, technocratic exercise. Bids for power and privilege may lurk in every proposal. Since 1993, the UN General Assembly has hotly debated Security Council reform, but has not been able to reach agreement. A handful of states aspire to permanent status for themselves, while many other countries reject such claims. Some wish to abolish the veto altogether, saying that it's the main source of the Council's paralysis, while others defended the mechanism. Many believe that UN Security Council reforms must balance the needs and interests of developed and developing countries. All in all, it's a very complicated matter. This uh, big power rivalry tensions sometimes make the United Nations Security Council the most important primary organization responsible for international peace and security, and they have not been able to deliver what they had to deliver. The bureaucratic dimension of the UN has also been a cause for frustration with the organization. Since it was formed, the organization has grown so big that at times it is working against itself. In 1946, the organization was staffed by a mere 300 people. Today, it has some 36,500 employees worldwide. There are now about 1,200 UN country offices around the world, with 100 nations that have more than 10 such offices. These country offices typically have large annual budgets, with a high proportion of resources going to operational expenses, leaving a small budget for programs. Furthermore, Many organizations within UN bodies have overlapping mandates. There are sectors such as water, energy, and health in which more than 20 UN agencies are engaged and compete among themselves to tap limited resources without a clear collaborative framework. Well, you start with the Secretary General, and the new one, Guterres, has a slogan which is less is more. He's been trying to cut back on programs and duplication in order to make the uh, UN a more efficient body. Uh, for example, um, on duplication, they, they had 1,400 offices for the United Nations Development Program. They've cut back on a lot of those offices. The problem is, though, that the UN is, there are so many demands on the UN that every time they tr cut back one program, they have to establish other programs in order to accommodate the needs of, of, of the world constituency. So it's not a very easy process, and it's one that plagues every new secretary general when they come in. We are working a lot to make the UN uh, more adapted to our times, but at the same time, let's be clear, big organizations tend to be slow in change, and many member states also do not want many changes. And um, obviously, uh, reforms like the reform uh, of the Security Council are very difficult. We know that. Um, and uh, other changes are very difficult. But at the same time, we see the UN becoming more and more a platform where people want to come. We see the business community coming to the UN. We see cities and regions coming to the UN. We see the civil society coming to the UN. We see young people coming to the UN. Financing is another enduring problem for the UN. Its cash flow problems, triggered as a result of withholding or delaying payment of assessed contributions by member states, has been so severe that Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, once said he wished he could sell his official four-story residence in New York to fill the gap. One UN official even joked that the UN was the biggest beggar in the world. In May 2020, UN spokesperson Stéphane Dujaric said there was still 1.62 billion US dollars unpaid for the UN's 2020 regular budget and 2.12 billion US dollars outstanding for the peacekeeping budget. The United States funds 22% of the regular UN budget, while China pays 12%. Of the 193 member nations, only 91 had paid their dues in full as of May 13, 2020, including China. The United States, however, has become the largest debtor, owing the UN billions of dollars in arrears. The unpredictable cash inflows, exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, 
has seriously threatened the UN's ability to conduct its work. Aside from traditional security threats, the UN is faced with other unconventional threats around the globe, such as terrorism, violent extremism, irregular migration, climate change, and environmental degradation. On top of that, technological advances have raised concerns about lethal autonomous weapons and cyber attacks, the weaponization of bots and drones, and the live streaming of extremist attacks. There has also been a rise in criminal activity involving data hacks and ransomware. International cooperation is needed more than ever to prevent such violence. Moreover, the power of the UN has constantly been under question. The global coalition, despite its broad membership, does not have its own standing army, sovereign currency, and law enforcement agency. In a sense, it's more of a forum than a force. Recommendations coming from the UN General Assembly are not binding, and it's up to each individual nation to comply. The US, for example, gets tagged in the press a lot for not complying. A global stage for diplomacy. A platform for international politics. A barometer of world affairs. The peoples of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. 1945. The world was screaming out its revulsion to the Second World War, and the United Nations was born of a collective hope for lasting peace. Its mission, to prevent war, uphold international law, fight for human rights, and promote social and economic progress. Tested by divisions, conflicts, and crises, 75 years on, is the United Nations fulfilling its mission? How did it get here, and where does its future lie? As the UN turns 75 in 2020, this documentary takes you through the times and tides of this mighty organization and looks into its future. The United Nations was founded in the wake of two world wars and at the precipice of the Cold War, well before threats like cybercrimes and online hate speech emerged. Today, the world is facing new threats that would endanger 21st century progress, from the climate crisis to the dark side of the digital world. Questions have been raised as to whether the organization is still relevant today. It's true that there exist numerous international organizations in the world. While most other international organizations are designed as either regional groupings, such as the European Union and African Union, or as organizations dealing with issues in a particular field, such as NATO and APEC, the United Nations is a true global organization, representing almost all nations on Earth and involving all aspects of global affairs. Hence, many believe the UN's role is irreplaceable. The United Nations Charter has a three main pillars. Maintaining international peace and security, sustainable development, and human rights for all. These can be realized only through the United Nations, which is the universal, the universal organization established by whole world's people. The world needs the UN because it has helped prevent disputes from escalating to war. It has established an international legal system through treaties. The UN Charter is the foundation that governs relations among nations. Since the end of the Second World War and the birth of the United Nations, humanity hasn't seen another war on a global scale. Yet, peace is still a luxury to people in many parts of the world. Today, countries like Syria, Libya, Yemen and Somalia are still ravaged by conflicts and wars. Achieving peace and stability for all remains an unfulfilled dream. To many, the international system shaped by the United Nations and its family of agencies 
has formed the bedrock of global relations and is central to peace and stability. The UN Security Council is still the best place for solutions to regional conflicts and wars. In search for a political solution to end the brutal conflict in Yemen, which has been dubbed the world's worst humanitarian crisis in the 21st century, the UN had successfully brokered talks between the government of Yemen and Houthi rebels and the signing of the Stockholm Agreement in December 2018. The agreement reached between the two warring parties in Stockholm, Sweden, included key elements, such as the establishment of a demilitarized zone around the port city of Hudeda and prisoner exchanges. Between 2012 and 2020, the UN Security Council adopted 26 resolutions on Syria with regard to resolving the Syrian crisis. In December 2015, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 2254 in an attempt to solve the Syrian crisis in a political manner. Following six months of armed conflict in 2011, the United Nations established the United Nations Support Mission in Libya to support the country's transitional authorities in their post-conflict efforts. The mission, most recently renewed by Resolution 2486 in September 2019, is primarily tasked by the Security Council with supporting an inclusive Libyan political process. It's also mandated to conduct human rights monitoring, support key Libyan institutions and efforts to secure uncontrolled arms, the provision of essential services and delivery of humanitarian assistance. The main motivation for creating the United Nations was to save future generations from war. Since its creation, the UN has often been called upon to prevent disputes from escalating into war or to help restore peace following the outbreak of armed conflict. By and large, the UN has succeeded in achieving that goal. The world is witnessing an increasing degree of global interconnectedness as well as a rise in borderless challenges. The global nature of such issues requires global responses. Events like the recent outbreak of COVID-19 prove that all nations are in the same boat and no single country can solve these global challenges. Multilateralism, not unilateralism, is the answer. And the United Nations, founded on the principle of multilateralism, provides a unique platform to search for multilateral solutions. When we face the, um, the challenges that we have, no country can do it alone. We need to do it together. So we do not need less multilateralism. We need more multilateralism. We do not need a weaker multilateralism. We need a strengthened multilateralism. Um, we need more international cooperation, not less international cooperation. At a time when the world is seeing the highest geostrategic tensions in years and a growing sense of global mistrust, the United Nations has emerged as an actor with distinct advantages in global governance, with equal representations of its 193 member states under the UN Charter. No, I cannot imagine the world without the United Nations. If national sovereignty is a fundamental pillar of the Charter of the United Nations, uh, uh, we, nobody wants a global government but we need to improve our global governance. It may be called the United Nations, but it may be called other way in different names, but there must be a universal global organization like the United Nations. And the countries need to be able to share more of their strategies, of their objectives, of their responsibilities in order to be able to address these huge fragilities and challenges that we face. And my hope is that everywhere, in the US, uh, in Europe, uh, in Asia, everywhere, people will progressively understand this and recognize that this is the time for international organizations to be supported and this is the time for multilateral cooperation to be strengthened. You are the defender of real peace. You are the leader who proved that no UN resolution... The United Nations is only as effective as the commitment of its member countries. As the organization celebrates its 75th anniversary, 
its future will depend on the political will and the support and cooperation of its member states. China will remain a pluralist leader. 积极参与全球治理体系改革和建设，坚定维护以联合国为核心的国际体系，坚定维护以国际法为基础的国际秩序，坚定维护联合国在国际事务中的核心作用。Created 75 years ago in the ashes of World War II. The United Nations has marked a turning point in human history. By becoming the world's mightiest structure for peace and development, the organization has remained true to its founding mission despite the challenges. It has made incredible advancement in maintaining global peace and security, promoting social progress and better standards of life, strengthening international law, and upholding human rights. We stand at a critical moment in the world's history. A time when humanity must choose its future. Despite the magnificent diversity of cultures, we are all members of one world with a common destiny. New, more sophisticated threats in the 21st century require imaginative, bold responses and strengthened collaboration between states. At a time when the world is wrestling with emerging global issues and rising geopolitical tensions. The United Nations points the way to the solidarity we need today and across generations. And as the UN marks another milestone in 2020, the journey for lasting peace and prosperity for mankind is far from over. United in action for the common good. That's what the UN is all about today and in the future. You've traveled to places where others couldn't be, seen things others couldn't imagine, and heard stories you can't be sure whether to believe. They say that you're privileged, that people look up to you, but only you know how much effort you've made. You're on the ultimate journey to discover a country with 5,000 years of history and nearly a billion and a half people. Is it a green countryside or a vast sea of neon lights and skyscrapers? Is it a dangerous land choked with smog or the blue sky of a summer's day? What is this China for you? And what is this China for the rest of the world? CGTN, see the difference. No war, no one again, we can hold in guns. We can jump in the world. Were you worried about your life at that no. particular time? Not at all. What is your assessment of the state of the continent today? Africa has the potential to power itself. Excuse me. 